Hi everyone, welcome back to this video series on cryptocurrency. Redeem, script and validation prior to version 0.9.2 of the Bitcoin Core client pay to script hash was limited to the standard types of Bitcoin transaction scripts by the is standard function. This means that the redeem script presented in the spending transaction could only be one of the standard types P2PK, P2PKH or multi-sig signature excluding return and P2SH itself as a version of 0.9.2 of the Bitcoin Core client P2SH transactions contain, sorry, can contain any valid script, making the P2SH standard much more flexible and allowing for experimentation with many novel and complex types of transactions. Note that you are not able to put a P2SH inside a P2SH redeem script because the P2SH specification is not recursive while it is technically possible to include return in a redeem script as nothing in the rules prevents you from doing so it is of no practical use because ex executing um, return during validation will cause the transaction to be marked invalid. Note that because the redeem script is not presented to the network until you attempt to spend a P2SH output. If you lock an output with the hash of an invalid redeem script, it will be proceed. It will be processed regardless. The UT XO will be successfully locked. However, you will not be able to spend it because the spending transaction, which includes the redeem script, will not be accepted because it is an invalid script. This creates a risk because you can lock Bitcoin in a P2SH that cannot be spent later. The network will accept the P2SH a locking script even if, if it corresponds to an invalid redeemed script because the script hash gives no indication of the script it represents. Data recording output return. Bitcoin's distributed and time-stamped ledger the blockchain has potential uses far beyond payments. Many developers have tried to use the transaction scripting language to take advantage of the security and resilience of the system for applications such as digital notary services, stock certificates and smart contracts. Early attempts to use Bitcoin's script language for these purposes involved creating transaction outputs that record data on the blockchain. For example, to record a digital fingerprint of a file in such a way that anyone could establish proof of existence of that file on a specific date by reference to that transaction. The use of Bitcoin's blockchain to store data unrelated to Bitcoin payments is a controversial subject. Many developers consider such use abusive and want to discourage it. Others view it as a demonstration of the powerful capabilities of blockchain technology and want to encourage such experimentation. Those who object to the inclusion of non-payment data argue that it causes blockchain bloat, burdening those running um, full Bitcoin nodes which carry in the cost of disk storage for data that the blockchain was not intended to carry. Moreover, such 
transactions create the UTXO that cannot be spent using the destination Bitcoin address as a free from 20 byte field. Because the address is used for data, it doesn't correspond to a private key and the resulting UTXO can never be spent. It's a fake payment. These transactions can never be spent are therefore never removed from the UTXO set and cause the size of the UTXO database to forever increase or bloat. In version 0.9 of the Bitcoin core client, a compromise was reached with the introduction of the return operator. Return allows developers to add 80 bytes of non-payment data to a transaction output. However, unlike the use of fake UTXO and return operator creates an explicitly provable unspendable output which does not need to be stored in the UTXO set. Return outputs are recorded on the blockchain so they consume disk space and contribute to the increase in the blockchain's size but they are not stored in the UTXO set and therefore do not bloat the UTXO memory pool and burden full nodes with the cost of more expensive RAM. Return scripts look like this. Return less than data greater than. The data portion is limited to 80 bytes and most often represents a hash such as the output from the SHA 256 algorithm 32 bytes. Many applications put a prefix in front of the data to help identify the application. For example, the proof of existence digital notarization service uses the 8 byte prefix doc proof which is ASCII encoded as 444F43505254F4F F4F46 in hexadecimal. Keep in mind that there is no unlocking script that corresponds to a return that could possibly be used to spend a return output. The whole point of return is that you can spend the money locked in that output and therefore it does not need to be held in the UTXO set as potentially spendable return is provably unspendable. Return is usually an output with a zero Bitcoin amount. Because any Bitcoin assigned to such an output is effectively lost forever. If a return is referred, sorry, if a return is referenced as an output in a transaction, the script validation engine will halt the execution of the validation script or mark the transaction as invalid. The execution of return essentially causes the script to return with a false at halt. Thus, if you accidentally, accidentally return, sorry, if you accidentally reference a return output as an input in a transaction, that transaction is invalid. A standard transaction, one that conforms to the is standard checks, can have only one return output. However, a single return output can be combined in a transaction with output of any other type. Two new command line options have been added in Bitcoin Core as of version 0 0.10. The option data carrier controls relay and mining of return transactions with the default set to 1 to allow them. The option data carrier size takes a numeric argument specifying the maximum size in bytes of the return script. 83 bytes 
by default which allows a maximum of 80 bytes a return data plus one byte of return opcode um, and two types of push data opcode. Time locks. Time locks are restrictions on transactions are outputs that only allow spending after a point in time. Bitcoin has had a transaction level time lock feature from the beginning. It is implemented by the N lock time field in a transaction. Two new time lock features were introduced in late 2015 and mid 2016 that offer UTXO level time locks. Um, these are check lock time verify and check sequence verify. Time locks extend Bitcoin scripting into the dimension of time, opening the door for complex multi-step smart contracts. Uh, transaction lock time and lock time. From the beginning, Bitcoin has had a transaction level time lock feature. Transaction lock time is a transaction level setting a field in the transaction data structure that defines the earliest time that a transaction is valid and can be relayed on the network or added to the blockchain. Lock time is also known as N lock time from the variable name used in the Bitcoin core code base. It is set to zero in most transactions to indicate immediate propagation and execution. If N lock time is non-zero and below 5 million, sorry, below 500 million, it is interpreted as a block hide, meaning the transaction is not valid and is not relayed or included in the blockchain prior to the specified block height. If it is above 500 million, it is interpreted as a Unix epoch timestamp seconds since January 1st, 1970, and that transaction is not valid prior to a specified time. Transactions with N lock time specifying a future block or time must be held by the originating system and transmitted to the Bitcoin network only after they become valid. If a transaction is transmitted to the network before the specified N lock time, the transaction will be rejected by the first node as invalid and will not be relayed to other nodes. The use of N lock time is equivalent to post dating a paper check. So I'm going to do it here today for this video. If you like listening, please consider like, sharing and subscribing. Thank you.